Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So uh, uh, on behalf of the ACNS Wellness uh, Committee, uh, and also on behalf of uh, Professor Kato and also uh, Dr. Roger, so uh, we are starting our ACNS uh, YNS uh, webinars uh, today. So uh, first, of, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Today our chair uh, would be uh, Professor Artu Bo, and uh, who, who is the professor and the head of the Department of Neurosurgery Surgery of the Network Memorial Hospital and a CGS uh, Medical uh, College, and also the chief neurosurgeon of the Tata uh, Memorial Hospital and Cancer Research Institute in uh, Peri Mumba, India. So for today, uh, we have uh, uh, three uh, speakers today. The first expert uh, speaker is uh, Professor Shaman Sharif, who will be talking about the CVJ uh, anatomy. And our one next speakers today is uh, Dr. Fark uh, Hassani, who will, be, who will be talking about what is the youngest age for wake brain surgery, a clinical case about the youngest patient in the literature. Our second expert speaker today is, is Professor Hiroki Morisako, who will be talking about the endoscopic and the laser approaches for skull-based tumors. Our discussion today, is, uh, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Mamed Selini, who is the professor of neurosurgery of uh, Senku University uh, in Turkey, and also the honorary president of the Middle East Spy Society in the spy section editor of the World um, Surgery. And also we have uh, Professor Kasati uh, uh, today, who is the professor and head of department, uh, the Department of Liu Surgery of the University of uh, Simbawa. And also uh, another discussion today is uh, Professor Jip uh, uh, Dan Danilov. Uh, who is the uh, scientific secretary, uh, head of the laboratory of the biomechanic inf inform informatics and artificial intelligence uh, of the R&D uh, Perdenko uh, Neurosurgery Center in uh, Moscow, Russia. To moderate this session, uh, uh, alongside with me, I have uh, Sachin, Dr. Sachin, and uh, Dr. Atik, and also uh, Dr. Uh, Sukiti, and also Zhu Yi Sang. And uh, Without further delay, may I intro, uh, may I may I invite our chair today, uh, Professor Go, to introduce our first speaker. Please, Professor. Yeah. So it is my great pleasure and also big honor to invite uh, Dr. Salman Sharif to give his lecture. We all know Salman is a very well known expert in spine surgery throughout the world. He has been the chairman of. Uh, WFNS Spine Committee. He is the chairman of World Spinal Column Society. He is chairman everywhere. Vertebral junction. We all know craniovertebral junction is a complex subject. Atlantoaxial instability is the most mobile, most common form of instability. And I have to completely say that. It is not a clearly understood clinical entity. It is under-treated clinical entity. Atlantoaxial instability is the most common instability of the whole spine. It is very frequently involved in degen degenerative spinal disease, which is not recognized in the literature. It is very well recognized in all the craniovertebral anomalies and alterations that we hear of. So it is an important subject. We have to learn every young neurosurgeon, every senior neurosurgeon have to learn, understand the anatomy and do a proper stabilization. So it is a good opportunity for all of us to listen to what Dr. Salman Sharif is going to tell us. And I'm sure we all will learn and grow further in this subject of craniovertebral junction. So over to you, Salman, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Salman. Thank you, Atul, and thank you, ACNS and Yoko and all my friends from ACNS who have been involved in doing these webinars. Really, it's um, amazing that you know we have been going on with these webinars and learning so much throughout this time. And I must thank uh, Atul and just to warn him that I may be saying something that he may not like, but at the same time, it's good to have a good discussion. And we always uh, learn from Atul. C1-2 joint, I don't call a C1-2 joint anymore. I call it goals joint. So it's actually, we should give this name to uh, Atul, who just uh, you know talks about it all the time. It's wonderful that we learn so much from you. 
Um, this is just a case to start with. 27-year-old male, road traffic accident at the age of 15, 12 years ago. He had a type 2 odontoid fracture and quadriparesis. Um, as he was managed conservatively at that time and improved neurologically over time and was walking and doing his normal um, stuff during all this time. Uh, the, uh, and he presented to ER after another road traffic accident when he collided with the dashboard. His power on the right side was five and lower limb was five approximately and three just to leave. his left side, the power was zero or five. Um, this was his CT that was um, done at the time of uh, his injury. And this is a coronal plane showing the same thing uh, with a fracture, which you can clearly see and mismanage from the last time as well. This was interesting because he presented to ER with neck pain a week before, and he was advised X-ray flexion extension, and which shows clearly instability that he had for all this time. And he said he continued to have neck pain throughout this um, time. This uh, MR clearly so shows the myeloma malaysia that he has uh, because of um, injuries previously, and probably now it had uh, taken a further turn and causing more problem to him. So it was a type 2 uh, non-union um, C2 fracture. Uh, we just put in a C1 lateral mass and C2 translaminar screw. And um, he, at the time of when he was seen at six weeks, his power had improved to two or five in left and four on the right. And uh, he's slowly improving with time and is going through rehab. That's his post-op x-ray. Uh, um, and we'll defend why we did this instead of doing many other things that many people described. Um, important for young people to know, the odontoid fractures are of um, three main types, and obviously they're subdivided further. And you know, type 1 is very basic in evulsion, which is a stable fracture. Type 2 generally is unstable, but many a times it could be stable as well. But you need to be careful. You need to see images carefully and which is a fracture at the base of the dents. And type three, depending on where the fracture line is, where is going and um, um, further uh, type of uh, injury, then you know it, it can be unstable uh, as well. Well, um, today's topic is anatomy of CV junction. So I'm going to concentrate on that and just uh, through that, uh, what things we need. We're gonna be talking about bones, joints, ligaments, nerves, and vessels. Uh, bones we need to discuss about are shown here. So if we start with occiput bone, you know the uh, posterior and superior part to the superior to foramen, we have squamous part um, um, of the uh, foramen magnum, and then there's a basal part. And basal part obviously comprises of the anterior to foramen, and the condyles and clivus is is in it. We know the thickest part of the bone um, posteriorly is the in, in the midline, and we need to know that if you're going to be thinking about doing occipital cervical fusion, which is now rarely done due to um, uh, brilliant work by Atul and many other people during this time and who have uh, showed us that in the main problem generally is at C1, C2 and can be addressed in majority of the cases. But let's go through uh, our... Um, um, C1, so two lateral masses, obviously situated in the anterior medial part of the ring. As you can see here, there's a short anterior arch with a tubercle anteriorly and a tubercle posteriorly, and this long curved posterior arch. And then we have foramen transversorium, lateral to the articular surfaces. The important thing to remember is that superior facet is oval and concave. And it faces medially um, and upwards. And the idea is that you know you can have rotation according to that and how much of movement you're going to have front and backwards. So inferior facet is circular and its, uh, its face is downward and medially. Uh, sulcus arteriosus is bilateral on the superior surface, you know, so it's going to be coming up to on this side. Vertebral artery turns 90 degrees medial after exiting into the sulcus arteriosus. So we, we know all this and, you know, it generally is about 1.5 to 2 centimeter from the midline. So it's safe to dissect 1.5 to 2 centimeter from the midline when you are exposing your C1. For C2, it has a dense, it's a peculiar structure and has a parse, has a large lamina and bulky spinous process. Uh, so you can see the spinous process is really bulky. Transverse foramen are on both sides as lateral to it and they direct superior laterally as you can see. 
uh, to allow deviation of the vertebral artery so that if vertebral artery can deviate um, and the way it rotates um, uh, just coming out of this. Pars interarticularis between superior and inferior articular uh, processes and is laterally bounded by a transverse foramen uh, and um, extend in extensions, a significant strain on facets due to offset coronal orientation and disproportionate uh, length. So if you do that, severe extension, then obviously you can have hangman's fracture uh, because of this uh, fracture. Um, um, foramen transversorium is lateral to the C2 uh, tubercle, as you can see here. It's angulated 45 degrees laterally, partially roofed by superior articular process. So basically this part, superior articular process is overhanging where the foramen is, is coming out. Um, the joints, um, occipital cervical joint um, is, is superior. Uh, principal motion at occipital, um, uh, uh, anti Atlanta occipital joint is fixation, uh, flexion, and extension. So that's how we move. And the reason being that, you know, uh, the type of joint that we have there is, uh, is it does not allow any other movement. There's slight lateral bending and rotation. Flexion extension is up to 24 degrees. So a lot of great extension is over here. Uh, flexion is ultimately restricted by the condyle and occiput while extension by the tectorial membrane. Posteriorly, uh, Atlanto axial uh, joint C1, C2. As I said, we call it Gold's joint. Uh, it's there for primary motion is rotation because of its being uh, circular. It rotates 30, 38 degrees to one side, so account for about seventy seven percent of total axial rotation of cervical spine. Odontoid uh, process uh, acts as a pivot, so on that basically it rotates. Uh, the ligaments we will go through them uh, one by one. So if you look at this, uh, first of all, so posterior longitudinal ligament is lying here and then it goes upwards and forms um, all the way up. Once it goes up, becomes a membrane tectorium. And you can see the transverse ligament is holding um, the dents back in front and making sure that it holds in place and rotation can be easily performed. You can see the anterior longitudinal ligament going up. And, and forming the anterior atlanto um, occipital membrane up and getting united there. So these ligaments you need to know. Uh, the apical ligament is an accessory ligament, as well as um, you've got two LR ligament on both sides as well. Posteriorly, we have got these uh, membranes um, uh, protecting it, and you've got posterior atlanto um, axial ligament as well. Uh, tectorial membrane, it covers the... Uh, the dense and the transverse ligament, and it's actually the continuation of the posterior longitudinal ligament superiorly above uh, C2. It's attached to the uh, cloves and the medial border of the occipital condyle. The ligament, the other, lig the strongest ligament we have is cruciform ligament, which has transverse and vertical parts that form a cross behind the cross. And it's a transverse ligament is the thickest, um, strongest band in the middle. And it's attached to the tubercle on the medial surface of the lateral master's axis on both sides. And it's basically acts as a seat belt, an atmical seat belt, and making sure that it restrains the dents. And our ligaments are on both sides, as you can see here. Uh, they're on the sides of the apex of dents to the medial aspect of the occipital condyle and the lateral mass of the atlas. So let's quickly um, see these ligaments one by one, starting from the ligamentum nuchae, and then going on to uh, the posterior atlanto occipital membrane, which is the continuation from above. And you see the uh, longitudinal fasciculus of cruciform and the transfers. So we remove them. Once we remove them, we see that the apical ligament in the center and the alar ligament on both sides uh, you can see as well. In front of that, you can see at, lean, at anterior atlanto occipital ligament, and uh, uh, that's the last bit that we are seeing in front. You can see the vertebral artery lies, uh, goes around the uh, superior arch, and then go, works, turns at another 90 degrees, and goes uh, in, through the foramen of magnum. Let me just, sorry, just move forward. Uh, so vertebral artery takes a 90-degree course twice. So it turns once it, it comes through the slant of that uh, foramen, it turns backwards um, and then laterally, and then again turns upwards and goes through uh, into the foramen magnum. 
So for posterior approaches, to um, I'm going to focus mainly on the posterior approaches, and that too, I'm going to focus on just um, uh, basic anatomy and not go into the details of what uh, is better and what is not better. So trauma, type 2, type 3 odontoid uh, fractures, type 2 with oblique fractures and frontal plane with significant displacement associated Jefferson fractures, type 3 with large kyphosis and barrel chest, uh, type 2 as well, and type 2 in elderly patients where there's non-union, and pseudoarthrosis after immobilization and in congenital malformation, just like OS or in agenesis. Uh, galley fusion could uh, work uh, reasonably well in certain situations when you don't have um, uh, screws. It offers good stability. The, the problem is it's a high chance of non-union. Uh, Sontag uh, technique, which is modified galley. If you, if you uh, don't have screws, then you can use that. Uh, so it's basically subliminal wire C1, nosh, aliacrest between C2 and wedge under C1. Edges we decorticate, and I'll just show you. And, and, you know, many people recommend halo after that, although in majority of the cases, even heart collar can suffice as well. So basically it goes underneath, you turn around and bring it around the spinous process. And then once you hold it together, then you put the graft, iliacris graft, and then you tie it. And then I know it, it works very well, in, especially in kids where you can't have proper side screws sometimes. Um, important to remember from anatomy, that the pedicle is really a, a small piece right in the middle here between the joint and the body, whereas sparse is lying all the way laterally um, just before um, our joint. And, in, and if you see in lateral position, so this is the sparse itself, whereas pedicle will be, will be all the way in front uh, medially. So if you understand that, then you can think about putting in parse or pedicle screws and how we can do that in this particular area. So transarticular screws are a technique of C1, C2, described by Magrill and Genera um, way back in 1970s. Uh, it completely obliterates, uh, obliterates rotational movement. Disadvantage is huge because of the risk of um, vertebral artery and steep learning curve. Um, and you do need a good quality preoperative CT looking at anomalous vertebral artery, bone destruction, and small particle size. Preoperative MRI to assess the degree of neural compression, and if it's been reduced or not, you need to know and, and, and look at the transverse atlantal ligament as well. Um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, entry point is generally at the site of C23 joint, just a few millimeter above that. K wire is directed 15 degrees medially, aiming at an anterior tubercle of C1 under fluoro. You should be care taking care that it's completely reduced and care not you're not going into... Um, beyond a C1 because into the soft tissue because there's significant um, um, uh, good structures lying in front. And then you repeat the procedure on the other side. And then you can do Sontag uh, wiring to stabilize it further. So this is what it looks like. So what you have is uh, about few, two to three millimeters um, uh, from the lower border um, of C2. Uh, and what you do is it's somewhere, somewhere in the middle point of the midpoint of the median and lateral part of your um, uh, uh, bone here. And then your angulation is 15 degrees uh, medially. And you've got a steep uh, angulation going in the sagittal plane going up to 50 degrees. Important to remember is that if it's not reduced and if you try to do that, you can cause serious issues with the vertebral artery. And that's why in some series, up to 20% of the injuries of vertebral artery are seen. The other thing is that you need to be prepared that you should be able to come up at an angle like that. So you need to have another stab incision through which you pass in your um, K wire and then put in screws on top. And this is how it's done and it's shown here. Uh, and, uh, another case, 24-year-old, fall from first floor, complain of neck pain and bilateral upper limb weakness, Asia A, uh, cervical cord contusion, secondary traumatic C2 vertebral body fracture. And in this particular case, um, again, uh, we just uh, did a C1, C2. I am a very good fan of laminar screws uh, because it's there much easier. And at the same time, if you're using many theaters, it's much easier for your SR or juniors to also put them in without causing any problems. And for that, you may not even need an image intensifier. Um, C1 lateral mass with C2 parts or C2 pedicle screw. So it's uh, 
basically um, Han and Goel described these and then advantage obviously is uh, that anatomical alignment is not necessary and may be used in an aberrant vertebral artery as well. Disadvantage is sometimes you can have significant blood loss when dissecting the C2 nerve root. And there are uh, tricks that uh, Atul and many have described as well and how to take care of it. It's much, it's very, becomes very, very easy. And the way to do it is that, you know, once you expose um, this area and you've got this large uh, venous plexus, so you just take a Watson chain and just go down on the C1 lateral mass directly from uh, stripping from the arch itself and going straight down. And once you come all the way down to the notch, then you dissect it, uh, push it down. And I generally do is uh, take some kind of hemostatic agent, maybe spongistan or surgicel, whatever, whatever you have you, uh, and you take a patty and just bring it down and bring it all the way down. Uh, when you need to use the joint, just like Atul uses in many of his cases, obviously there are two ways. If, if you can do this all the way, then it's okay. Otherwise, you can just coagulate and take the nerve root, uh, uh, C2 nerve root. Many people uh, do that without causing any significant problem. Once you have done one side, then you can just put in a patty, then go on to the opposite side and do that. By the time you finish that side, the other side would have dried up and really it, it becomes uh, an easy operation instead of a very bloody operation. Um, so there, there are uh, three uh, types of um, screws that have been a conventional entry point, which is A, and that is atolls, and then you can have, go into the arch itself, and then you can also go into the notch. Uh, obviously, if you're going to put in your screw uh, where Atul usually do, uh, does it in the middle, then you know, you're going to be going slightly more up, whereas when it's in the notch, it's slightly lesser. Whereas when it's coming from the top and B, then uh, you will have a bigger screw. The problem could be that vertebral artery could be arching here and may, may this area may be really thin and you may be causing problems to yourself by causing a lot of bleeding. So I, generally, I, you try, should try to avoid that. Uh, so, a posterior fixation using C1 lateral mass screws and C2 particle screws. Um, so, the advantages and disadvantages are shown, shown here. Um, so, three uh, different methods of lateral mass screws is, is, as you can see, the Gold's technique right in the middle, whereas uh, Tan described this arch technique uh, going on the, um, just on the top of the arch and two millimeters above. Whereas a notch technique described by Lee back in 2006 also stands, but really the results are much better when you use Atul's technique. Um, the important thing to remember when you when you come anteriorly, the, you're going to see the hypoglossal nerve and tunnel carotid in front, so you don't want to be coming out here. The reason being that obviously the arch um, is uh, in oblique way, it has got a slant, and this much up to 7, uh, 0.7, million, uh, 0.7 centimeter uh, could be the area where you think if you take a lateral x-ray, then you, if you go anterior with your screw, then you can cause significant problems with hypoglossal internal carotid. And your your patients may not like this area if you go into it. So this is really a, a very um, expensive territory and you should be careful going into it. Um, just uh, a quick video. Uh, so you can see this is the midline and this is uh, C1. And now we're getting just clearing the C2 up and putting the translaminar screw. And they, they take don't take much long time. Very simple. Just need to hold it to make sure that you, you don't cause problems to further injuries. And then this is um, C1 screw on one side and C2 on the other. You've got it prepared right in the middle. And then do your usual, um, then get fix it together and move forward. So you can you can have a transarticular screw, which is really could be risky. You've got a far screw, which is a shorter transarticular screw and doesn't cause serious problems. So that is safe. C2 pedicle screw is as safe as well, and C2 laminar screw is probably safest of them all. Uh, C2 par screw is, as I said, is is a short um, uh, transarticular screw. The only um, uh, thing is that you know majority of the people that they use it routinely use use shorter screws. Trajectory is similar to C1 C2 transarticular screw. Entry point is three millimeter 
um, rostral and three millimeter lateral to the inferior medial aspect of the inferior articular process of C2. And you can see the angulation for uh, bar screw, it is very, very steep. Whereas for um, pedicle screw, you can see, let me just show you. Um, so bar screw follows the same trajectory going 40 degrees up and 10 degrees medially. For, for the pedicle, um, I think you know the important thing to remember is the entry point is two millimeter superior and two millimeter lateral to that of bar screw. So you're going all the way laterally and then um, coming across and you have a, not that of a steep, but maybe around 15 to 20 degrees going up. Laminar screws are very simple and generally uh, easy to do. And what how you do them is um, you start one screw superior and uh, anteriorly, another screw posterior and inferiorly. And the side you choose according to which size is up. Usually one side is slightly up and one side is um, slightly down and choose accordingly. Um, and many people uh, generally are using this routinely and you can go up to 30 um, millimeter screws without causing any problems. And there are simple screws to put in. And so you have got these three techniques that you can use for C2 and whichever suits you is fine, I think, but uh, you need to be careful with the vertebral artery when you're doing these. Uh, the reduction of these screws, if you put in a translaminar screws, is actually easier. The only thing is you need to cut a rod at the end. So uh, otherwise, it actually cause, is, is ideal for this angulation for it to be reduced. So I'm again grateful for everyone to giving me this chance to uh, present and uh, hope to see you all soon. So thank you. Thank you, Salman. And now I invite Mehmet, our dear friend from Turkey, one of the, like Salman, one of the premier spine surgeons of the world. And I think uh, Mehmet was also chairman of the World Federation. And Mehmet has got big series and big CV, which is difficult to say on the screen. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure they will give good ideas about what Salman has said. Mehmet, please go ahead. Th th thank you, Atul. Thank you, Salman. Yeah, very nice lecture, actually. Uh, Salman has uh, explained not only the anatomical details, but also some screw trajectory, uh, which are... Um, somewhat sophisticated by many spine surgeons uh, who have not uh, working, who have not much experience at the region. The, this region is really uh, a very complex region because it is, uh, on one hand, it is uh, protecting most precious structures and also it is providing uh, many movements of the uh, head, uh, flexion, extension, and rotation. So then uh, I think uh, it's necessary to learn the details of the anatomy of CV junction before starting those surgeries. So uh, I see also in, in our cadaver courses, um, many, many uh, young surgeons uh, want to learn in cadavers before starting the region uh, surgery. Um, and I would like to uh, uh, remark that vertebral anatomy is is must be learned before before the surgery with a uh, CT angiography uh, to uh, work in the area more safely. Otherwise, you can get uh, difficulties uh, and you can injure the artery. Accordingly, you can you can change your. Uh, fixation techniques according to the artery. Uh, another one is that I want to tell, although Salman has nicely shown the wiring techniques, they are they have now historical uh, importance. Uh, we, uh, I am not using them anymore, uh, actually. Probably in some small children, it may be uh, done, uh, but uh, one point, they are not providing a very uh, good fixation and uh, external immobilization is still necessary after uh, applying a wiring. Uh, do you want to comment about that, Salman? 
I totally agree. I think uh, we we have discussed this so many times that you know you could use in pediatrics only. And second thing is stability is not as much, and especially rotation is a big problem there. Um, but yeah. where we where we don't have facilities, I think you know long term uh, immobilization with a collar and safety procedures because if they don't have screws, then yeah. Yeah. I thank Salman for giving a very uh, nice details of uh, anatomy and also details of uh, up-to-date fixation techniques of the region. Thank you. Yeah. So at thank Lando you. Action Joint is a difficult anatomy. They are called atypical vertebrae. The transverse process of atlas is the largest transverse process of the whole spine. Spinous process of the C2 vertebra is the largest spinous process of the whole spine. The facets of C1 and facets of C2 are the largest facets of the whole spine. So we have something atypical about the C1 and C2 region. C1, C2 joint is the most mobile joint of the body. And as I have mentioned, that C2, C1, C2 joint is the most unstable joint of the body. We do not recognize instability so often on radiology because atlantoaxial joint is a flat and round joint. But atlantoaxial joint is quite an unstable because it is flat and round and movements are very high. When movements are high and joint is flat, there can be a big possibility of instability. So now I wish to invite Professor Kalangu to give some comments and then we can go further on the discussion. Is there? No, uh, not yet, he isn't here. Kazadi is not here, no. Okay, so now let me say about a few more issues about uh, the stabilization technique. As uh, Mehmet has said, wire techniques are very rarely used nowadays and screws may be not very expensive, Salman. I'm using screw fixation in C1, C2 since 1988. In the For the most poorest of poor population of the world I was using, I'm in a public hospital. And we could make, design our own screw since 1988. I don't think cost is a factor. The issue is the anatomy is so tricky and difficult that sometimes there can be difficulty in doing lateral fixation techniques. And in those difficult situations, which are, you know, with the evolving understanding of the subject are less common, but in those rare situations, you can resort to a compromised situation of midline wire fixation. That is another possibility. The other thing is occipital, if you ask me, Inclusion of the occipital bone is also a very rare situation now. Very frequently this was done earlier. But inclusion of occipital bone in the fixation construct is also a compromised situation. The facets of C1 are strong and huge. And we should use the facet of C1 for screw implantation. Opening of the joint is very important. This art has to be learned. It, this art is difficult art, but has to be learned. Whenever we do fixation of C1, C2 joint, opening of the joint is, in my view, very, very critical. Open the joint, introduce bone graft in the joint, and then do fixation. I used to resort to the spaces which we described for the first time in literature about 25 years ago. Over the years, my use of spaces is very limited now. I resort more to introduction of bone graft in the joint. Vertebral artery in C2 is a critical anatomical understanding which Dr. Salman has very beautifully shown. And when it is high riding, there are other means to avoid that high riding vertebral artery. And there are ways to learn to avoid vertebral artery in very high kind of situation also. You can do C2, but you have to learn the various techniques which are described in the literature. Assimilation of atlas, platybasia, Rostral location of the articulation of C1 and C2 can make screw implantation of C1 difficult, but that does not mean you resort to suboptimal occipital fixation. So it is very important to learn these techniques because the scope of C1, C2 fixation has ra quite radically increased over the years. 
as some of you might have read my work on TRE malformation, I recommend C1, C2 fixation for basal invagination of all kinds where transoral decompression was recommended, where foramen magnum decompression was recommended. My feeling is absolute and my feeling is complete that in those situations, C1, C2 fixation is a dramatically gratifying operation which we have to learn. And if you, you know, if you have experience in trauma cases, you can do in complex cases because in some cases of KRE malformation, seringomyelia, there can be a lot of venous bleeding in the lateral gutter, which one has to learn to control that venous bleeding. So the understanding of C1-C2 articulation anatomy is so critical. And uh, I think Salman has shown some pictures. But you have to understand that uh, this anatomy, C2 ganglion anatomy, I don't think Salman has touched on C2 ganglion anatomy to that extent. Ganglion is located right behind the C1-C2 articulation. Ganglion is located in extra spine. of ganglion, cutting of ganglion, taking it up, taking it down to get to the facets are such critical steps. I had written long time ago that cutting of ganglion makes a window to the atlantoaxial joint. But of course, now I am not cutting or only very seldom cutting the C2 ganglion. It is the largest ganglion of the spine. And to cut the largest ganglion, it should not be done unless it is necessary. But if it is necessary, it can be cut because there is hardly any kind of uh, consequence due to C2 ganglion. And I am saying that this ganglion sectioning was one of the most landmark alteration or revolution in the understanding of C1-C2 articulation and C1-C2 technological technical. Uh, innovation at that time in 1988. So, and the indications are increasing quite dramatically, even for degenerative subaxial spine, for OPLL, and things like that. You have to resort to atlantoaxial stabilization in a significant number of cases. So, this uh, mess, so many messages have been given during this lecture and by Mehmet. And I think the young people in the audience. And I can understand. And there is no way one any young person can say, I don't want to learn C1-C2 joint. If you don't want to learn C1-C2 joint, there is a huge loss that you can have. So you have to learn C1-C2 stabilization technique because if you do a good stabilization, you give good new life to the patient. On the other hand, if you create a complication, you can have a very, very nasty complication at your hand. You can create quadriplegia. You can create various complications. If you damage the vertebral artery, you can have very nasty complications. So you cannot create a complication. And we have to learn this area. We have to learn anatomy in three-dimensional perspective. And in the patient, the anatomy can be different from what you have learned in anatomy. The artery may go behind the C1, under the C1 arch, it can the high riding can be go can go very high. There can be intraspinal course of the vertebral artery, and so many courses have been described. But you have to learn to avoid these situations. You have to do stabilization even when this situation is present. And we have to learn various ways, particularly when there is basilar invagination. There are fusions, C23 fusion, C bifid C1, bifid C2. So many um, permutation and combinations are present. There can be clipper file situation. You cannot say I can do only in trauma cases. There are all these cases can be a real anatomy clinical presentation for every one of us, and we have to do a beautiful fixation because it is a fantastic, gratifying, result-oriented operation. There can be no gratification more than doing a solid C1-C2 fixation. What do you have to say, Salman? Anything, comments, so we can wrap up quickly for the next presentation? I think I, I totally agree what we have said, and uh, our discussions will continue. Uh, there are a couple of questions, uh, if we can take them. Ben, you wanted to say something, sorry? Yes. Uh, thank you, Salman, uh, again, for your very educational lectures, and I'm so glad that we have so many spines experts here. 
my my first question is about sometimes in trauma cases so uh you have to deal with the uh, halo wings so um uh do, uh during your uh, fixation surgery so how how do you deal with the halo wings do you remove it and do it or you keep it keep the halo wing uh, while you're doing the 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 surgery and uh, my second question is about um Usually after the fusion uh, surgery, uh, do you prefer any kind of the uh, of hoses, and how long would you pace them? Um, I think you know, generally speaking, uh, halo ring we do not use. Uh, they are monsters. They cause serious side effects, and you know there are many, many, many papers out there. A lot of evidence that you know it actually causes serious. Um, um, uh, injuries as well as serious problems, psychological problems to these patients. So mm -hmm. I think uh, generally speaking, we don't, we we reduce it there and then. There was a question from Lal Rahman from Pakistan and he was asking that we do the C1-C2 screws, but if the reduction is not possible, we can cause neurological deficits. Yes, we can, but you know, reduction is nearly always possible. You know, I don't remember the last time we could not reduce. I think it's been many, many years. I think... Um, me, Atul, and Mehmet have had this discussion multiple times that it is easy to reduce and there are simple tricks to it. And uh, so that's not an issue. Regarding uh, orthosis, uh, we just give a Philadelphia collar just to ensure that we uh, that is of only used for four weeks. Uh, previously, you know, when I was training, we used to use it for three months, but now only four weeks. Anytime we are concerned that no, we there is some um, something lacking. We did not do it as good as we wanted to do. That's a different story altogether. And you know there are some patients who um, I kept in collar for three months, but generally speaking, no, we keep keep it for a short time. And those patients could be those patients who have problems with uh, bone density and bone strength. And you know in those cases as well, or if you feel that your screw was not as strong as you wanted it to be then you know you could use collar for a little longer time so that your bone graft takes up. It's just common sense. Thank you. Um, Any... We can move on. Is that a speaker? Yes. Physical? You think uh, we can uh, go uh, to the next? Sachin, uh, sorry, Sachin, sorry, wanted, Sachin, Sachin wanted to say Yes, something. Sachin, Sachin. Hello, Sachin. Oh. Thank you, and uh, Professor Salman Sir. Uh, very glad to listen to your lecture. It was very uh, precisely focused for the young neurosurgeon. The anatomy and the screw direction and trajectory was very well said. Just for the discussion sake, uh, with the mercy of Professor Atul Goel, I've started doing C1-C2 myself. Every time I do it, I don't finish my surgery without remembering him. But for me, the most crucial part of this surgery is the positioning. I would request you if you could, uh, you know, put some light on the position. But some places you you won't have a three pin field. You'll have to position with the horseshoe. Like any tips for the positioning for the young neurosurgeons? I th I think uh, positioning is the most important step. And unfortunately, horseshoe is not the way to do this surgery. Otherwise, you will cause serious problems during surgery, and results may not be as same. Uh, the alignment will not be as good as you want them to be if you used um, horse tool. So if you don't have a horse tool, get a mayfield of some kind. Uh, otherwise, mm -hmm. I think it is dangerous doing it. Uh, positioning is the most important thing that I feel when you've got a spinal injury and patient has come to you or for whatever reason you're fusing it. Uh, in this area, we, uh, anesthetists need to know that the blood pressure has to be up from the very first start. So before you turn the patient, your map has to be somewhere around 75, 80, not less than that. I think that's important to understand. Then again, you know, you as the uh, leader should be taking control of the neck and stabilize it while you're turning it. And without Mayfield, I think it is um, no more a safe operation to do. Yeah, maybe... Um, 40 odd years ago, you could do that, but not now. Um, and then positioning has to be, you, you need to reduce what the problem is. And you know, once you have reduced it, then it's easy. And you, you can easily do that. And the lateral X-ray shows everything very, very well. So I think that is uh, the important is not to have too much flexion, not to have too much extension. And uh, again, to have some kind of flexion and then extension uh, on the lower spine to bring the C, C1, C2 up and make it easier for yourself. But I think if you keep the map up, then you know the, generally the risk 
could be really minimized. Um, and then once you're putting in screws, if you can stabilize C1 and C2, either with a hook or maybe as you uh, saw in one of our cases, using it, uh, holding it with some kind of nibbler, anything you know um, that would hold it, stabilize it, uh, would be much, much, much better. Uh, so I think uh, without three pins, it's probably not the safest thing to do. Yes, sir. I completely I also do a Mayfield head clamp always. I use yeah. Mayfield head, mm -hmm. head clamp. Yes, agree, Emma. Uh, Ahmed Fawaz wanted to say something. Salam alaikum. Konnichiwa. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, to Professor Salman Sharif, uh, nice and uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. We are proud Thank of you, you Professor Dalili. Good comments and also uh, Professor Goel. I uh, like to know your uh, ad uh, advice and um, guide uh, for whose countries uh, that haven't the possibility for uh, fixation, and like Afghanistan. And uh, we have uh, just possibility for uh, immobilized with hollow uh, base or with a Minerva jacket. And uh, is it, uh, do you think it's enough or because we haven't, unfortunately in Afghanistan, the possibility for uh, fixation of Kevin cervical junction and uh, not uh, uh, both equipment and instruments are imp uh, impossible and un unbelievable. Uh, we like uh, especially for our young colleagues uh, in Afghanistan and this, you know, this limited uh, uh, transportation and uh, reach to uh, uh, neighbor countries. Now uh, this, it's also uh, difficult to go to Pakistan as well. And uh, for this, uh, like to uh, know your advice for our uh, young colleagues and uh, young neurosurgeon in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ahmed Fawaz. Um, uh, you're right that uh, it, it could be problematic, but at the same time, I think these Mayfield, you can get locally made. They're made in Salcote, and they are like uh, one-tenth of the price of the actual Mayfield. They are very cheap and dependable. M many small uh, hospitals in Pakistan use them, so it is easy, and it's also supplied in Africa, and they are really low cost. So, and you know, you know very well that despite the blockage of uh, the border, a uh, lot of transaction is still happening. So if, if, you know, I get so many Afghan patients as well, and they still continue to come despite the border being blocked. So it is possible to uh, take it across. And you're most welcome if whenever you want to come, you know, we'll be happy to show you cases. We'll be happy also to provide you with this stuff and guide you how you can, uh, do that. And, you know, we have discussed this many times before, and hopefully we should have you over to buy in Pakistan in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Wa alaikum salam. I will uh, communicate with you, inshallah. Inshallah. Mehmet, your comments? No comments. Good. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to all, all these uh, surgeons who have less resources. There is another question, actually, which says um, uh, the first case presented in their role of conservative treatment was done in the first case, as you presented. Yes, uh, you know, initially it was treated conservatively and patient improved, but unfortunately it developed another injury and it was unstable on flexion extension x-ray clearly, and that's why it was used. If I hope I, can cl I cleared it that out. I think we need to move on. There's a lot of time that's gone by. Um, Yoko, uh, or Atul, yes, you yes, yes. yes, yes. Okay, Dr. Ben. Yeah, let's please, please proceed. Yes, thank you. Uh, Professor, may I invite the Professor Go to in, introduce our next speaker? Yes, let's go on to the next speaker. And I'm sure we will learn a lot on endoscopic from our very esteemed speaker. So let's go on to the next speaker, okay? Sorry. Um, I think the, the next speaker should be uh, Dr. Fat uh, uh, Hassani, who will be talking about what is the youngest age for rig pain surgery, a clinical case about the youngest neurosurgeon in the literature. So, P Professor Go, would you mind introduce uh, uh, Dr. Fat? 
Well, I don't know much about Dr. Friend. Why don't you do it? Sure, sure, sure. And uh, sorry. So uh, for the next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Fred, uh, who is the uh, chairman of the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Award Committee and also delegate to the WFNS uh, Panel uh, Neurosurgical uh, Society. So, uh, so uh, this time um, uh, we have, uh, and Dr. Fed is also the consultant neurosurgeon in uh, Chai Khan in the National University Hospital, and also the clinical lecturer in the uh, Abdulkasis in the in the National University of Health Sciences, and the coordinator diploma of cirrhotic surgery uh, UIASS in uh, in Morocco. So, uh, without further delay, uh, shall, shall I invite uh, Dr. Fed uh, for his presentation? Thank you so much, uh, Ben, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rikokazu and all the team of the ASEAN Congress of Neurosurgeon for the kind invitation. It is my honor to be here with uh, such a huge uh, and well-known neurosurgeon around the world, uh, uh, Professor Atil Gouwele, talking about uh, uh, surgery 25 uh, years ago. Um, my career is more or less than that. And uh, to be here with my uh, teachers, uh, and it is so difficult to speak after uh, Professor Shalma, uh, Salman Sharif, uh, a great teacher, and uh, and thank you so much uh, for the invitation. So uh, my talk is just question, uh, is case, uh, but one question, uh, it is possible for less than seven years old child to have awake uh, craniotomy. So, uh, uh, I'm trying just to uh, to share with you a clinical case and have a discussion and uh, thoughts about this uh, uh, some special and difficult situation. Here we have a girl, five years old, three months history of epilepsy and trigonal hypertension. The clinical examination is just uh, there is no weakness, no def neurological deficits, and you can see here this heterogeneous uh, lesion, parietal lesion, with the heterogeneous enhancement maybe some bleeding but um, this question here uh, what we should do we need to do surgery so how so the first step is so contempl contemplation so we we start to the, the uh, to see this lesion what is the risk what is uh, uh, what can we do what we can't do and uh, we, uh, we were motivated we have uh, just a young experience uh, almost 24 uh, cases of uh, wake surgery uh, only uh, and only in uh, only one child eight years old so uh, this is five years old this was uh, difficult to decide in the beginning so even you are motivated as as a surgeon as scientific you need to analyze the situation so we go for the feasibility of awake anatomy and the range that we find on the literature is seven years old as a limit uh, as a limit, uh, se several single center uh, experience and uh, the age on this uh, literature review was between eight and 17 years old. And even six patients had postoperative neurological weakness with awake surgery and two surgeries were stopped because there is a lack of cooperation with, uh, and discomfort of this uh, young patient that it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, the youngest one. So, uh, we, uh, we see that uh, what we can do, uh, what we can do, what we, uh, we we can do for five years old girl. Should we do just classical surgery? So it's nothing, uh, not nothing, just classical surgery situation, or should we move for wake brain surgery? So um, yeah. uh, functional MRI. Uh, when the radiologist was doing this uh, the surgery, he told me Fed please don't even think about asking for functional MRI. We didn't, we didn't uh, ask for it anymore since a uh, few cases because uh, we know that it's not that efficient for having information. And uh, we are from low and middle income country. So we need to think about eco uh, health economics. And we, if we don't use it, we don't ask for it. So there is no question. We need to do wake brain surgery uh, to minimize 
a risk for this uh, girl, at least try. So what we have done is we take our time for pre preparation, almost two weeks. Uh, uh, the patient gets familiar with all the team, the OR team, the uh, department team. Uh, we celebrate her fifth anniversary uh, in our department. Uh, uh, we make it a big event and everyone uh, bring uh, uh, gifts. And uh, we, we were... Uh, I was also invited there for this anniversary. It was, uh, it was the idea of uh, the team, not my idea. So uh, we have uh, uh, teamwork for that. There is no discussion with the, the kid about what will happen at the OR, but enough explanation and advice to parents. They were, uh, they were part of the uh, the team to uh, to do this work surgery. So uh, uh, the anesthetic plan made with different scenarios with uh, all, all the team, what we, we can do uh, in each situation and uh, what is the process to follow we don't have time to think about what we're gonna do we don't have time to innovate or uh, create new uh, new, uh, new 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 situations uh, um, dealing with new situations with uh, just uh, in moment uh, uh, ideas so and we did the site as protocol to do sleep motor mapping protocol followed by a work mapping protocol at least we're gonna do sleep mapping if we can't do it so in the surgery we do uh, sleep wake and sleep uh, uh, protocol and uh, for the sleep uh, after doing this uh, craniotomy in the sleep uh, way so we do the sleep motor mapping uh, and uh, we start to simulate and you can find that here we have this in the anterior border of the brown uh, brown spots on the cortex uh, we used also navigation we find this uh, this uh, this response on the uh, right uh, right hand uh, so uh, after that uh, uh, we move to another place. Yes, there is all the anterior border with this. Uh, 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 have a response even with uh, uh, very few intensity, one point five. So this is the situation. I don't know if I have shared audio. Excuse me. I will share again my uh, my uh, my presentation with audio. I hope I have. I can do it. Yes, yes, with audio. Okay, so you can see here that we are trying, uh, the anesthesiologist is uh, uh, is trying to wake up, uh, doing, uh, we take time to do that. And we give her the gifts. We, uh, we made uh, it's, uh, the, uh, the, the toy. We made this toy from gloves in the department and uh, she was used to, to present uh, her uh, as her toy and uh, uh, and we make scenarios with her with the, this uh, this toy to be uh, to be ready to uh, to wake up in this uh, uh, during the surgery you see here this is the first contact with the autophonist this uh, uh, mohammed spent almost one hour with uh, with, uh, with our kid uh, with our patient uh, just to be uh, to, to make her in comfortable situation uh, to be ready uh, to wake up she was in peace uh, when she saw him so uh, we uh, it was uh, it was not that difficult to wake up her oh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. what we do is that we drink phone and the phone was uh, the family cannot at can't attend they would they won't attend the surgery it was so difficult i understand them but we bring them to the or uh, uh, theater with uh, this phone with video call and they she when once she asked for them she starts talking with them and was Hi, yeah. Hi, our uh, our patient Bravo, c'est ok. C'est Bien, 
Well, uh, Mohammed was a uh, good. She tell her drugs. She, she loves your own surgery, and it was a uh, good opportunity for us for her to uh, propose for her total removal with good possibility of outcome, no weakness. We, we were just lucky. Unfortunately, it was embryonal NOS four. Uh, uh, at least we increase the safety for this young patient on the literature. And uh, she she had chemotherapy and therapy, uh, therapy will have 18 months follow up. Let, let's see this. The uncle asked for this MRI one month after. We have this enhancement in the bed of the, the, the tumor with edema. Uh, six months after, we, don't, we didn't have any uh, 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 any. Um, the uh, in uh, in enhancements and uh, this is the follow up after 18 months follow, follow up she's doing good so when i was preparing this uh, uh, these slides i find that we, uh, there is another systematic uh, the, few, uh, the the first systematic review about this awakening autonomy in pediatric population and what we can have they selected all the papers and all they selected 30 papers and all on these 30 papers 70% were the swimmers or in the left uh, the, the left side more males there is 77% of tumor for this pediatric pa uh, patient the range is for 7 uh, 7 to 7 uh, to 17 uh, no less than uh, than 7 and they talk about complication during surgery conversion to general anesthesia monitoring task and non completion intraoperative seizures and postoperative complication uh, especially motor weakness and let's talk about uh, uh, prim uh, uh, about and completion of too tasks. task. There is 20%, almost 19 uh, patients, and, uh, and also on positive complication, there's 19%. So let's see that. Uh, 19% of uh, of uh, postoperative complication uh, 19 patients on uh, almost 100 has this postoperative complication even with awake surgery. So it it is not they don't say that it is because a completion of no monitoring we don't know on uh, among these surgeries but at least the, the these surgeons try to to do what their best, but ever, ever with that we have complication. So imagine if we, uh, if such situation they don't have this wake surgery. What about anesthetic protocol? In general, it's sleep wake sleep procedure, large variability anesthetic protocol, almost ten protocol on this systematic review, and no difference in complication regarding the type of protocol, and especially no guidelines, no guidelines for this anesthetic protocol, not guidelines how much we should give as uh, intensity, how much, uh, what is the area to, uh, uh, to simulate, the, uh, uh, for how long, uh, how long, uh, what we should do for cortical and subcortical in this young patients we don't know how to uh, how to do it we just do it like we we are playing that for adults i think it's different at least we are lucky to have this uh, nice smile of uh, 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 of uh, our patients and uh, we are thankful that we, we, we could do it i i hope to have um, uh, your idea your thoughts about this situation and if you have any experience about that to improve our uh, practice in uh, in tumor surgery in neurology for this special patient thank you so much Uh, Professor Kato, uh, Dr. Goel has some connection problem. So maybe yeah. we can start with the discussions. Yes, I, I think so. Yeah. So but, thank you very much for a nice presentation. So but, uh, in Japan, we have a guideline of the awake surgery. But that, that is a uh, uh, permit over uh, 15 years old. So because of the, the uh, infantile or well, very young, uh, under the seven years old, is a uh, quite sometimes during the surgery, so they will have some panic. So sometimes uh, uh, some danger uh, continuing the, the surgery, sometimes uh, uh, fixation will be a loss, some, some, something like that. And also, you're not sure because they can answer uh, very correctly or not. 
So that is uh, my concern. Thank you very much. Anyway, congratulations. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk. Thank you. You, you have uh, any comments? The age limitation. Can you understand my question? Yes. So, uh, Professor, uh, thank you, Professor, for your uh, uh, your question. The age limitation is our was our concern. If uh, the panic of the patients is the main problem, and all the patients that uh, was in the lecture, the main, uh, the, the most of them was the conversion to anest general anesthesia was because uh, discomfort and no cooperation of the surgery. So uh, we ta uh, we take time. For this uh, for the, uh, this patient to prepare her very well, and uh, it it, uh, it it was it was just miraculous to have this cooperation because even in some adult patients we don't have cooper uh, enough cooper uh, co co cooperation some cases and there are we have uh, data about uh, about that so uh, it's as I said we tried. Uh, to have this situation and we are just lucky we, there is no scientific uh, uh, support of that uh, what is what is good that we we find that there is uh, a large area of slip of um, of motor uh, motor motor cortex from uh, in the border anterior border of the tumor and when we wake up this patient we didn't find any motor area there so this is, I didn't say that in my presentation. Uh, we don't know how, maybe someone can, uh, can help me to understand mm -hmm. why we don't find uh, the, the same as, as sleep, a sleep mapping, as a wake mapping in this, uh, in, in this area. And we were able to do this, uh, this total uh, removal. What changed on the, uh, changed the prognosis of this embryonal tumor if we do the removal instead of do, do partial removal or just biopsy. So, Yes, it, uh, uh, okay. uh, what I'm talking about guidelines, there is no guidelines for this such uh, youngest patients. Do, do we repeat it again? I don't know if you will repeat it with another patient. It's not just, just that, that easy. But uh, if we have this, uh, this opportunity to offer the security, the safety for patients, so yes, uh, maybe we, we're going to try as okay. we try for every patient. Uh, did I answer your question, Professor? Yes, yes, thanks so much. So maybe the Abida can you ask a question. Uh, yes, Professor Carto. So, uh, Dr. Fahd, what I didn't understand is in the asleep thing, you had the MEPs in a different place, and when the patient was awake, uh, mm -hmm. what did you find when the patient was awakened? Was awake. There is no motor, uh, the motor cortex, the, mo uh, the, uh, the, the motor area was. Uh, further anterior to this, uh, what we have in a sleep uh, sleep area. So you so, stimulated, you stimulated, and you got contraction at an anterior. Uh, yes, but, 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 yes, but it was far than the, the tumor uh, region. So so far. And what current you used when you were stimulating the initially when the patient was asleep? Sleep one one point five uh, milliampere. 1.5 and we 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 have this. Uh, it's I think it's uh, it's not that uh, that much. Or having so, a okay, so I think the awake one is more accurate, of course. Yes. The motor region, maybe there was spread of the impulse and you got it at a posterior region, but I'm yes. not sure. So, anyways, very nice presentation and so uh, congratulations for your work. Thank you. So uh, much. Can yes, Raja. yeah, just see that the, the guidelines for uh, Japanese awake surgery. In that, it is written that uh, children who are seven years or less, it is difficult to excite the cortex with electrical stimulation. That is one of the main reasons they have not uh, ventured into younger ages, less than seven years. That's why in all the major uh, articles you find seven years is the age that above that they have uh, done awake craniotomy. Yes, if, exactly. If you allow me, there is several papers that talking about that. The papers of uh, Professor Hugh Dufu, that less than ten years old, uh, it's so difficult because of there is maturity of the cortex, maturity of the connections, and uh, 
uh, yes, uh, I think for cognitive, but for uh, for motor, I think it's some kind different. Uh, I don't know, especially I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it's uh, when you are front of a patient that there is no clinical sign and you have lesion front of motor area. Uh, you uh, the the the, the third uh, the first thing that you uh, I'm talking about why she is coming to my office why I have to deal with that because it's the most difficult situation uh, and you have to deal with that you have to take uh, I think that all of our our, uh, our masters have to take this uh, this step further to uh, to experience some. Uh, some new challenges beyond the borders. So, uh, I I hope that we can study that more uh, in the in the future with the more yeah. uh, scientific basis. Yes, it's accurately to uh, cases. Ben. Yes. Uh, thank and congratulations. And I'm a similar question uh, with uh, Roger, but uh, I want to ask about some technical aspect. Is the uh, do you ever compare the stimulation threshold, the threshold, uh, with uh the pediatrics and also the adults? And uh, in your case, uh, what uh are the stimulation uh, threshold for your motor mapping? And also, do you do the subcortical mapping as well? In your case, what are the um uh is there uh any differences that you observe from the uh compared to the adult? Uh, excuse me, uh, Ben, but I didn't get your question about threshold. What is the threshold that we use for this uh, patient? The, 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 the stimulation uh, threshold. What 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 is the uh, the what, what was uh, for the, yeah was it, and uh, we 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 goes from one to uh, three. Okay, one to three, so, until one. until two, and we stop. Uh, uh, th there is many. Uh, uh, we uh, they, uh, we didn't have any uh, any any arrest, so uh, we uh, we stopped. So so I I mean uh, what uh, mini ampere that uh, you used to stimulate? Yeah, yes, one milli ampere from one to uh, to three. To three, Into and then three, then you get the stimulate. Uh, and and uh, this for awake for sleep. Uh, we start with one point five. Uh, mm. and uh, we 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 have this uh, response in the se in, in the first uh, in the first time i see so I we see. try to to uh, to have more to show we don't we don't want to have uh, scissors i see thank you you're welcome i think ben we can move on if there are no other questions thank okay you, okay thank you uh uh, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Hiroki uh, Morisako. Uh, he will be talking about the endoscopic and the laser approaches for scalp-based tumors. So Professor uh, Hiroki is the, associate, is the assistant professor of the Department of Neurosurgery of the Graduate School of the Mes uh, Medicine in uh, Abenuku uh, in Osaka, Japan. So uh, so I invite uh, Professor uh, Hiroki to share uh, his screens and uh, please uh, start uh, your presentation. Okay, so uh, thank you for your kind uh, introduction. So the, it's a, a great uh, honor to the, make the presentation uh, in this uh, the uh, excellent uh, HNS webinar. So the, uh, so, oh, Professor Hakuba, Professor Ohate, and Professor Goto, and I uh, have been continuous modification of the scalp-based approach to safe and maximum tumor reduction. Uh, recently, the, uh, two years ago, the, uh, the name of our institute uh, changed from the Osaka City University to the Osaka Metropolitan University. So the recently, endoscopic surgery has been introduced in the management of intracranial region with increasing indication. So today, the, my topic is endoscopic and laser approach for scalp-based tumors. So the uh, so that's 
endoscopic endonasal uh, approach is uh, the good indicated for the uh, midline located tumors. Uh, 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 like show that this the uh, let inside this the let the circles. So the two reach the this the uh, region. So the many bony structures obstructed the uh, to uh, access these regions. So at first, so the telegraph process was uh, the is uh, very obstructed. So uh, where we usually uh, drill out this the uh, uh, base of the telegraph process, and after that the expose of the internal cavity, and after that the, we the, remove the crevice and reach to the uh, subdural space, and expose uh, the region widely. So at first, the, I will explain endoscopic and endoscopic approach for the supracellular region. So uh, this is uh, the uh, ten years old the uh, female. The uh, the case of the uh, 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 third ventricle, the uh, craniopharyngioma. The region is relatively large and lobulated, much lobulated, and the extent the posterior side. So the uh, this is a surgical video. At first, uh, uh, we uh, drill out the uh, bony structure, the midline skull base widely, and uh, expose the uh, dura mater widely from the uh, tuberculum muscle to the uh, 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 crevice. So uh, at first, uh, we uh, at this time uh, we remove the both side the posterior coronoid process. And so after that, we cut to make the skin incision around the cellar floor. At first, uh, the, uh, we the, uh, expose the normal pituitary gland and uh, transpose the uh, right side and cut the uh, diaphragma and expose the region. Uh, and uh, we the, uh, cut the tumor capsule and uh, internal developing of the tumor was uh, started. After the uh, decompression of the tumor, we dissected the tumor capsule from the optic chiasma and the, uh, keep the... Uh, uh, so this is a very the hard, the uh, main the tumor component. So the, we the, uh, crush this part by using the uh, QSA ultrasound sample. And so the, uh, after that, we the, uh, started the peel off the uh, tumor capsule from the surrounding structure. Uh, so uh, we the, uh, meticulously the, uh, uh, dissected the uh, tumor capsule from the uh, uh, floor of the south bank group. And so the, uh, uh, we the reduced the tumor volume the piece by piece. And so the... Uh, Tumor operated the uh, uh, intrasado ventricle, so the uh, we the uh, hold the uh, tumor capsule from the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, up to the uh, caudal the side and the uh, dissection of the tumor from the um, uh, half So uh, this time the uh, this is uh, the tumor uh, the out uh, here around the uh, uh, basal top. Uh, so. This is a very the dangerous part because uh, the posterior side of the this capsule is a mobility body. So the uh, we the uh, made the uh, remove the tumor piece by piece, and so this is the final phase of the tumor resection. Uh, finally, the we the dissect the tumor from the uh, mobility body, and so the. Uh, so meticulous procedure was uh, required uh, during the this the part of the tumor removal. So the uh, gently the uh, retract the uh, final piece of the tumor. This is uh, the final component. So the uh, we hold the uh, small piece of the tumor capsule and remove the uh, uh, all the tumor capsule like this, so we achieved the uh, gross total removal of the tumor through the endoscopic uh, the procedure. Uh, the, uh, after the tumor removal, reconstruction uh, was performed after the uh, several suture of the uh, dura mater of the cellar floor, 
and uh, covered by the uh, nerve septal flap and uh, uh, packs the uh, gelatin sponge like this and finish the operation. So uh, this is a uh, pre and post-operative MR image. So of course, uh, this patient uh, showed the uh, on hypopituitarism after the operation, but the tumor was uh, the, uh, completely removed uh, without any trouble. So next, I will explain the trans approach. So the trans approach, the, uh, at first we uh, uh, drill the uh, uh, medial side of the uh, base of the terigo process widely and expose the BDN nerve and uh, make the surgical corridor to the uh, inferior side of the uh, cavernous sinus and the Meckel's cave. So uh, this is uh, after the exposure of the uh, internal carotid artery. The, uh, uh, after the opening of the dura mater, the, uh, there is uh, the uh, 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 cadaveric uh, uh, dissection of the left side. Uh, the, if the tumor located the Meckel cave, uh, we can reach uh, this the, uh, region uh, through the uh, endoscopic uh, transterigoid approach. So this is uh, one the uh, surgical case. Uh, this is a very the young the, uh, patient uh, with uh, trigeminal schwannoma. Patient showed the uh, mild abnutence nerve palsy. Uh, so uh, we selected the endoscopic the procedure in this patient. So uh, during the uh, trans approach, at first uh, we opened the uh, maxillary sinus and also that removed the uh, etomoid bura and uh, widely the exposed uh, the anterior and the posterior uh, uh, etomoid sinus. And after that, uh, we started to drill the, uh, 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 base this part of the uh, uh, terigoid process and uh, the uh, after that we the uh, uh, remove the bony structure around the ICA uh, this is a paracryval ICA with uh, completely the expose the uh, this uh, part of the dura mater and uh, after that we cut the dura mater just the uh, lateral side of the uh, paracryval RCA and make the surgical corridor more the uh, deeper side. Uh, once the, we reach the, uh, the uh, Meckel cave, the, uh, we can the, uh, identify the tumor capsule. So the, we the cut the, the capsule and the make the, uh, that uh, tumor removal like this. So, uh, uh, so after the internal debulking of the tumor, we could identify the uh, normal fiber of the trigeminal nerve, and also the, there are some of the uh, CSF uh, coming uh, to uh, from the uh, uh, so posterior to the nether side. So the uh, uh, like this, we remove the tumor uh, uh, like this, so subcapsular the fashion. So uh, we uh, reconstructed the uh, skull base by using the photo graft and the uh, nerve septal flap and finished operation. So this is a pre and post operative MR images. The tumor uh, was uh, removed uh, uh, and uh, post operatively the patient uh, showed the uh, improvement of the uh, abducens nerve palsy within the uh, one month. So the next is uh, transcarbonous and cryobar, the petrosal approach. So the uh, trans, the, uh, uh, this approach, the we the usually uh, expose the cavernous sinus. So the, I will explain the uh, anatomy of the cavernous sinus. This is uh, the inferior component of the cavernous sinus. Uh, at, after opening this part, the uh, we can identify the uh, abducens nerve uh, just lateral side of the internal carotid artery. And so the, uh, this is a superior component of the cavernous sinus. This is a medial side of the internal carotid artery and the lateral side of the normal pituitary gland. Through this uh, uh, component, uh, we can identify the third and the fourth nerve. 
uh, like this. And uh, this is a lateral component of the cavernous sinus. This is a lateral side of the internal carotid artery. This part is uh, the, uh, we can uh, identify any lateral trunk of the, uh, like this. And also the, there are many the uh, nerves, uh, cranial nerves three, four, uh, fifth and the sixth. So the, usually this part is uh, not so the indicated of the surgical removal. And so the uh, through the superior component of common sinus, the, we can reach the uh, subdural space and expose the PCA and the third snap. And so the uh, this is six snap uh, like this. And so the caudal side, the, we can expose uh, the uh, vagal artery and the six snap uh, completely. And also the more caudal side, the, uh, we can uh, identify the uh, artery, the uh, pica, pica, and the lower cranial nerves. So I will show the, uh, some cases. So this is a middle-aged uh, female of the uh, recurrent of the cavernous sinus meningioma. So uh, uh, we already performed the tumor removal of this part through the orbitozygomatic and anterior transpetrosal approach. And also the, we added a gamma knife. But the tumor recurs like this. So the, uh, in this case, the SCA was completely encased by the tumor. And also the, this is the preoperative the, uh, angiography. The left side uh, internal cut artery was uh, uh, almost occluded. And so the, there are some the anastomosis uh, EC from the uh, external carotid artery to the uh, brain surface. So transcranial approach, if we selected the uh, uh, transcranial approach, in this case, it's a very the high risk to the newly the infection of the left the cerebrum. So we selected the endoscopic endonasal approach in this case. So the uh, before the operation, uh, we uh, uh, make uh, made the uh, uh, coil embolization of the left side ICA and uh, we uh, uh, performed the tumor removal in this case. This is a surgical video. Uh, we uh, expose left internal carotid artery like this. And so the, this is the uh, uh, caudal side of the uh, uh, cry valve. And uh, widely exposed the dura of the skull base, we started cut. At first, we opened the superior component of the cavernous sinus. And so also the, we opened the uh, inferior component of the cavernous sinus and uh, exposed the internal carotid artery, paracryval IC like this. And at this point, we uh, could identify the abducens snap like this. So we uh, added the uh, uh, dural incision along the uh, Six snap, and after that, the, uh, we the started the tumor removal uh, like this. So the uh, so we the uh, <coughs> widely opened the uh, uh, this is a, a lateral component of cavernous sinus uh, partially removal of the uh, embedded tumor inside the lateral component of cavernous sinus, and this is uh, the. Uh, around the uh, optic tract. Uh, we removed that part of the tumor and expose the, uh, this is uh, the vagal top and expose the PCA and SCA. This is uh, the uh, SCA completely uh, encased by the tumor. The tumor, fortunately, is relatively soft. We can, so we could evacuate the, uh, some part of the tumor. This is a six snap in subdural space. So the, we uh, also the, removed the tumor, that part. And so the tumor was uh, extended the more lateral side. So we added the uh, uh, bony removal of the petrous apex and make the surgical corridor more the lateral side and expose the STA, a more posterior side. And also that we cut the, some part of the tentorium. After that, we Put the remove the some part of the tumor, just the medial side of the temporal lobe, and uh, follow the posterior side. We remove the tumor as much as possible. 
So this is the final view after the tumor removal. So the reconstruction of the uh, this the uh, white opening the skull base the uh, dura mata uh, with uh, uh, suture some the dura mata uh, by using the fat edge of the fat and so the covered by the nasal septal flap and uh, fix the this the flap by using the zero uh, uh, sponge and the fibrin glue. So this is uh, the uh, uh, post-operative MR image. So the most part of the tumor uh, could removed uh, like this. Uh, so, but uh, this is uh, the uh, post-operative diffusion weighted images. Some of the small infection was uh, the occurred, but fortunately there's no the uh, new neurological deficit. So patients so the show any the uh, 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 motor deficit or the fissure, so the uh, heart condition is uh, very good now. So next, this is a middle-aged cordoma. This the tumor, the uh, completely the uh, compressed uh, brain stem, like this. So this is a good indication, also the good indication of the endoscopic endonasal procedure. So at first, the uh, way the uh, the relax, the bony structure widely. This is uh, the uh, uh, seraphora, and so the uh, this is a uh, uh, some part of the tumor uh, protrude the the uh, spinal sinus. So the we make the uh, uh, next net class the uh, bony removal around this, and this is a right side uh, carotid artery, parallel the uh, ICA, and so. Uh, Caudal side, we uh, drill out the uh, cribal bone uh, to expose the uh, lower margin of the tumor. This is uh, the bony structure on the, the foramen lacerum. Uh, we uh, drill out the, this bony structure. And so this is uh, the uh, dorsum cell. Uh, we uh, drill out the dorsum cell. And uh, also the, we remove the uh, <coughs> Uh, posterior cardinal process. This is uh, the uh, also the abnormal the bony structure. So some part of the was the embedded by the tumor. Uh, after that, the, we the, uh, started to remove the uh, uh, subdural space. So to expose uh, the uh, caudal edge of the tumor, we added the drilling of the uh, lower glibus and uh, make the uh, uh, additional the uh, uh, dural incision caudal side and started to, to remove the tumor uh, neticulously. And the posterior side, uh, we could identify the vaginal artery. So we uh, uh, remove the tumor neticulously dissection between the tumor and surrounding the arachnoid like this. And the, uh, we remove the tumor piece by piece not to injure the, any the artery or cranial nerves like this. And the tumor was the, uh, located more the lateral side, especially the right, the caudal side. Uh, we removed this part. And this is a right side of the sense nerve. So this part of the tumor was tightly adhered to the uh, abdu sense nerve. Uh, this is a left side of the sense nerve. Left side of the sense nerve, uh, just a compress by the tumor, so the we could the preserve this nerve easily. But the, the right side, the tumor was the uh, tightly out here. So uh, we uh, performed the neticulously, the dissected the, this part of the tumor, but the small piece of the tumor, we couldn't remove because the, we should preserve the uh, uh, right side of the sense nerve. So the, after the tumor removal, we the, uh, reconstructing the uh, skull base by using a photograph and the nasoceptal flap. So this is a post-operative the MR and the CT image. So the tumor was uh, the, uh, uh, nicely removed uh, like this. And the patient of the sense nerve uh, palsy was uh, improved just uh, uh, within the uh, one month after the operation.
So this is the final case. This is a, a middle-aged uh, the female uh, with uh, the chondrosarcoma. Tumor was the, um, uh, invaded uh, uh, around the lower cranial nerve and so the lobulated and reached to the uh, uh, caudal side. So the, the procedure of the all the same of the um, uh, uh, Cordova surgery. So the we need to see drill the uh, bony structure around the skull base before the tumor removal. The, this is the uh, left side of the ICA, and this is a uh, 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 inferior component of the cavana sinus. This is uh, the abducens nerve of the left side, and so oh, the we the remove the tumor like this and expose uh, normal uh, dura mater just behind the uh, tumor. And this is a dolly route around, just around the jugular tubercle and uh, cut the dura mater around the, this is a low, just the uh, caudal side of the lower cranial nerve. Uh, we could evacuate uh, that part of the tumor, uh, invade the uh, uh, posterior poster, and so the uh, we uh, uh, remove the uh, tumor uh, that extended the caudal side as much as possible and finish the operation. So this is a post-operative MR image. So we could uh, achieve the subtotal removal of the tumor like this, and so the uh, without any the trouble. So the uh, uh, how to run the endoscopic skull base surgery is so the uh, we think the uh, off the job training and on the job training the both uh, they are very the important uh, to run the endoscopic skull base surgery. So according to the off the job training, the cadaveric dissection and uh, uh, practice using the hands on training model, uh, they are very the useful. And uh, uh, on the job training. So the experience as the main operator, as a surgical assistant is also very important. So the, we usually adopted the uh, four hands with two neurosurgeons the, uh, uh, setting uh, during the endoscopic endonasal approaches. So uh, this is our the surgical setting of the four hands by two neurosurgeons uh, in the endoscopic endonasal approach. The, at the nasal part, otolaryngos perform the uh, surgery, and uh, the, uh, then the, we uh, started the uh, four hands by two neurosurgeons uh, uh, surgery. The surgeon and the scopist roles uh, change according to the surgical situation. Uh, before the, uh, the uh, uh, tumor removal, so the uh, uh, during of the bony structure and exposure of the region was uh, performed uh, uh, fellow or resident uh, with uh, uh, supervised by the expert uh, surgeon. And uh, the uh, in, so uh, intradural procedure and the tumor removal uh, is uh, the performed by the uh, expert surgeon and the scopist, also the expert surgeon or fellow. So the, uh, uh, we the, uh, change the uh, 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 surgeon and the scopist, the uh, uh, according to the surgical situation. And this is uh, the, our the, uh, setting. The, usually the uh, main surgeon stand at the right side of the uh, patient and scopist stand at the left side of the patient. Uh, so the main surgeon usually use the uh, right nostril and inserted the instrument uh, like this. And the scopist the, uh, insert the uh, endoscope uh, through the left nostril and also the use the another instrument uh, so that we can uh, uh, perform the four hands the uh, two neurosurgeon the technique uh, in the uh, endoscopic endonasal surgery so the benefit of the four hands uh, surgery is uh, first is the management of the critical neurovascular vascular structures and second the safe maximal reduction of the scar based tumors and third, the usefulness for assistant to obtain surgical technique. And so the, this is a very the, uh, good the education for young neurosurgeons.
So in conclusion, the appropriate use of the endoscope has improved the efficiency and the outcome of the surgery for skull base region. According to the pre-surgical simulation, by using cadaver dissection, neurosurgeons could get uh, more anatomical information about skull base region, uh, which uh, would lead to the better prognosis for patient. Uh, for hands, the endoscope and neurosurgery by two neurosurgeon technique is effective procedure to manage critical the neurovascular structures. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Moritako. That was a very fantastic uh, uh, presentation and very good cases. Professor Kato, would you like to make a comment? Then I will ask my question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Warisaku Sensei. So you showed us many uh, wonderful cases. So I think uh, uh, you uh, emphasized to how, to how to learn uh, uh, off the job. I think it's yes. very, very important. And yes. also, the, your institute is uh, uh, welcoming the, the fellows uh, from abroad, or do you have such system? Yes, so usually the, we have the many the foreign the, uh, uh, students, and uh, the, uh, uh, they so the learn how to the perform the, our procedure and me so that they usually the uh, uh, adapt the our the uh, setting after the coming back to the other uh, country. So that is another very very important thing yes. for awareness. Thank you so much, Abira. Uh, Professor Morisako, I saw all your cases and I think the craniopharyngioma. For yeah. the chordoma, for chordosarcoma, very good endoscopic approach. But I'm just wondering for the trigeminal schwannoma, why did you choose this approach? Because coming by the lateral approach, yeah. the schwannoma is in the yes. upper layer, in the you know interdural. And uh, Professor Goel has taught us this approach by the lateral subtemporal approach. So why did you prefer the endoscopic way? Okay, thank you for your question. So that is a good uh, question. So the uh, that case. That is a very the young, the 10 years old, 10 years old male, and the region side is the left side. And the tumor was relatively small and protruded. The, the, that patient showed the uh, abdominal of palsy. It's meaning the, the location of the tumor is uh, the uh, caudal side of the Mekir cave and the uh, uh, grown up the caudal side. So the, yeah, so the if we the access that, uh, the transcranial approach, Maybe the patients show the trigeminal, the severe, the dysfunction after the operation, and there are some risk to the damage of the temporal left temporal lobe. So the, uh, that's why the, we selected the endoscopic and the procedure. But usually the, we the selected the transcranial approach for the trigeminal schwannoma because uh, the, some part of the tumor is uh, the protruded uh, uh, fossil fossa. In such a session, is uh, the uh, Transcranial approach is a good indication. And recently, the, we the adapt the uh, endoscopic, the anterior transvertebral approach for the trigeminal spheromas. That is a, a new the procedure for the less invasive surgery for the trigeminal schwannoma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morishako. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Farhad, I think you have a question. Yes. Thank you, Sensei uh, Morisako. Yeah. for your beautiful presentation and uh, tremendous cases and outcome. I have two questions uh, regarding yes. the uh, different endoscopic uh, endonasal approach that is extended transclival or transcavernous. Do you tilt the head in relation to different approaches uh, or you keep the head in neutral position in all the cases? Number one. Number yeah. two is uh, how often do you use uh, lumbar drain after the surgery? Uh, or how often do you get CSF leak after yeah. cutting the skull base? Yes, uh, yes. What is the practice protocol of yours? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your uh, question. So the first is uh, the usually the I the uh, 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 make the head more the uh, head up the uh, uh, position uh, by using the the uh, about the, the uh, so twenty or fifty degrees so the we the raise up the head and so the to reduce the, the uh uh venous the uh breathing so that's a very the important uh, uh point to manage the to decrease the breathing from the uh, vaginal plexus 
there sometimes we encounter the massive bleeding from the vaginal plexus, but the, the we usually the uh, 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 hit the laser up so the we can reduce the bleeding from the uh, venous the uh, object. And second, so second question is so the uh, uh, we the usually don't insert the lumbar drainage. The during the uh, such the uh, uh, skull based uh, uh, region. So, uh, it, of course, there are some of the patients show the uh, CS leakage after the operation, but uh, the in our the experience, just uh, the uh, two or three percent of the patients show the uh, post operative the uh, CSF and require the additional the procedure, but the, uh, usually we don't insert the uh, lumbar drainage uh, because of the, uh, the number of the uh, patient of the CSF leakage very, very the, uh, so, not so much. So the recently we, the, but the, usually we the suture the, the dramata of the skull base. So uh, that is, uh, uh, I think, the very the important uh, procedure to the prevent the post-operative CF leakage. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Professor. Uh, ben? Yes. Uh... Thank you so much and uh, congratulations on your team uh, for Professor Maurice Echo. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, echo um, uh, uh, or, or uh, concerning the comment on the trigeminal scrotum in our center, we would consider doing the endoscopic transorbital uh, surgery. So, which is a light uh, light route with a minimal invasive approach and uh, without, um, I, I will not say uh, without much mobility because um, there's still a possibility of uh, injuring the neurological structure, but it's uh, quite a good route to approach this lesion to achieve the gross total removal. And uh, my my question is about um, uh, what what is your opinion in the trans uh, trans pterygoid and the trans clifo approach? So, what would be the most natural limit of these two approach? Would you consider the Doralos canal or the internal acoustic meatus uh, as the more lateral or the jugular foramen as the more lateral uh, limit for these two approach? What is your opinion? And do you think that uh, to approach this, uh, we need... Um, uh, may, may, maybe my next question is about um, the... If you want to expose the whole features portion of the ICA, do you think that um, the, the contralateral transmaxillary approach as discussed, that, as proposed that by the Pittsburgh group is uh, necessary yeah. to to to, uh, to expose the whole features portion uh, of the of the ICA to the to the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube? What 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 do you think? Oh, well, thank you for your question. So the uh, in our the uh, institute, so the the approach is so the uh, most important is the origin of the tumor. So which is the origin of the tumor is very very important. If the tumor the the uh, arises from the cribal or the uh, petrous apex, the it's meaning the uh, cordoma or chondral sarcoma. It's uh, the uh, maybe the endoscopic end of the procedure is the uh, best uh, procedure, uh, but if the tumor is uh, meningioma, and the, the attachment of the tumor is a tentorium or the uh, the petrocribal or more posterior side or lateral side, it's uh, not a good indication. Maybe the uh, transcranial approach is uh, better. So maybe the I think the uh, origin of the tumor and how the grown up that that tumor is a very, very important to the uh, consider the uh, best surgical procedure for the region. So the, of course, uh, the, if the tumor is uh, the uh, image, the lateral side of the internal acoustic meatus or the uh, around the jugular uh, foramen is uh, not a good indication. Maybe the transcranial approach is better. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, uh, second, the uh, uh, please uh, again. So, second question is so. What is the second question? Sorry. Uh, 
how the the pictures pictures portion of the ICA. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so do, do you yes, think yeah. So you the see? yes, of course the uh that is a, another option uh to the make more the lateral surgical corridor to make it. But so uh, as you mentioned, the use touch and tube is uh, the uh usually the uh, obstructed uh, surgical corridor to make more lateral side. Uh, after the complete exposure of the uh, petrous portion of the carotid artery. After the petrous portion, after the complete exposure of the petrous portion of the carotid artery, uh, we can uh, uh, retract the internal carotid artery uh, a little bit the lateral side. Uh, but the, that is uh, the uh, limitation of the endoscopic endolens approach. So uh, another option is that the uh, uh, contralateral the transmaxia, so that is a good uh, option, uh, I think so. Mm -hmm. And I see, uh, yeah, and I can see uh, 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 Professor Jip, uh, uh, Daniel, uh, Danilov, uh, for, forgive me uh, if I pronounce it right, and uh, you have uh, some comment? Yes, uh, thank you so much. I, I have a short uh, comment or more uh, a question then, then a comment. Uh, thank you, Professor Marisako, for a very informative lecture and with comprehensive illustrations on endoscopic and the nasal approaches for scalp surgery. Uh, since my professional interests are in digital technologies in neurosurgery, I would like to ask uh, if I am allowed three questions from that perspective. So the first one, do you use uh, interoperative neural navigation or any devices for neurophysiological monitoring for that type of surgery? The second question is, do you use any preoperative computer modeling for planning the surgery? And the third question is, what do you think about interoperative identification of um, neuroanatomical structures in, in the nasal skull based surgery using artificial intelligence? Uh, do you have any experience? Do you aware of that technologies or do you believe uh, they might be helpful? So thank you. Okay, thank you for your good questions. So the uh, usually we the set the, uh, use use the neural navigation in the endoscopic the uh, skull based surgery, and mm -hmm. also the you uh, we usually use a uh, visual evoked potential the monitoring or the uh, abdominal sense nerve or oculomotor nerve. The, that is uh, the our uh, the uh, standard setting of the. Uh, during the uh, tumor removal of the skull base through the endoscopic and the laser approach. Uh, but the, actually, the, uh, that monitoring is uh, the, sometimes uh, the useful, but the, the most important is uh, to expose the normal the structure. Uh, so the, uh, we usually the, uh, drill out the uh, white the, uh, uh, skull based the uh, bony structure widely and expose uh, normal the uh, dura mater and the uh, identify uh, so we the uh, estimate the uh, uh, location of the normal the uh, uh, so important the uh, vascular and the uh, the nerves so the before the tumor removal and started the uh, so the uh, starting the tumor removal that is very the important uh, uh, surgical steps uh, during the tumor removal of the such a uh, uh, complicated uh, uh, condition for uh, the tumors. So uh, usually the, we uh, don't uh, the perform the preoperative the surgical simulation. That is the, so very the difficult. So the, uh, uh, to make the, uh, uh, so the simulation is so, um, some some of the institutes so makes the beautiful the uh, surgical estimation, but the in our suits that, that usually that we don't make the uh, uh, 3D model or the virtual simulation. Uh, but so the important is the uh, uh, so the uh, maybe the uh, we should learn the micro surgical the normal anatomy uh, through the uh, endoscopic end approach. That is very important and also the uh, so uh, we estimate the uh, origin of the tumor uh, which is the location of the origin of the tumor and so that we can uh, uh, estimate the location of the normal the important structure uh, so that is uh, the very the important uh, uh, point uh, before the surgical uh, surgery yes mm.
And do you think that uh, some uh, interoperative technology that helps to identify critical structures would be helpful in that type of surgery, or you think it it won't be it won't boost uh, the surgery? Okay, so the uh, so we usually use the Doppler, so to the identify the uh, so internal carotid artery, and so the that is very the useful. But the, the uh, another so. Uh, Recently, we can use the, the uh, ICG, uh, interoperative ICG through the endoscope, but that is uh, not so the, uh, useful the, uh, in, the, uh, the, in the tumor cases. Yeah. So Thank you, so say, uh, do you use such kind of the DTI or maybe yeah. Daniel wants to ask you? So, I think that that's not so the uh, important so uh, with your yes, yes, uh, mm -hmm. not so useful, yes. Mm -hmm. So then you just I might ask because you mentioned about AI. So the, in your country, I think uh, how you can apply the, the tumor removal. Uh, thank, thank you, so thank much. you so much for that question. Yes, I'm really interested in artificial intelligence studies. Uh, to the date, uh, most of the studies are just at the state of research, uh, so research stage, and um, they're not allowed for uh, clinical practice. But uh, I do believe that an important uh, issue, an important uh, target you know, to address with artificial intelligence could be the intraoperative automatic identification of critical structures using computer vision. That might be an issue. Another another target uh, may be a preoperative diagnostics when we try to identify um, histological and molecular or uh, molecular uh, subtype of tumor just by MRI or MRI plus PET plus CT. You know, um, uh, th that could be a very interesting part, uh, an interesting uh, topic and using artificial intelligence and of course a classical uh, classical um, uh, topic and classical target uh, is the preoperative uh, assessment of um, of the risks for the surgery that is planned so this preoperative risk assessment and risk certification could be also a very important target but uh, uh, let me tell it again uh, this uh, th this projects are only research projects, so we don't have a, mm -hmm. um, a hands-on ready instrument. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So can so I much. also ask uh, uh, Professor Jip about uh, what what is your thinking about the future uh, uh, the future perspective concerning the AI in a skull based uh, neurosurgery? What 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 is your opinion? Uh, thank you so much. I'm very optimistic about that. Uh, I only should say that probably uh, when the computer technique will advance and the, the amount of data will uh, enlarge, we will have uh, some other type of artificial intelligence technology that we're working with uh, today. And so what I believe would be important uh, in using artificial intelligence is the safety of procedures and uh, the minimization of invasiveness of these procedures. And that is quite understandable. So with computer vision, with uh, radiomics uh, or digital biopsy, you know, with uh, identification of critical anatomic landmarks, uh, uh, with the um, intraoperative technologies, I, I think that we will improve the safety of surgery and we will reduce the number of complications uh, and uh, increase uh, the gross total removal of uh, um, uh, skull-based tumors safely. So that is the point and that is the target and everything else, I mean, the technology uh, is the rest. So the technology should follow the same. That's my opinion. And uh, thank you so much. So uh, may I ask if there is uh, any further comments from the floor? So uh, if not, uh, shall I invite Professor Kato to make the final remark? Before me, maybe Dr. Liu. So you want to show us something? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to make an announcement. Yeah, konbawa. 
I would like to make an announcement <laughs> with this upcoming uh, event. Uh, if you allow me to share my screen. Okay, this is a Congress uh, or meeting online web meeting, which is free. Uh, hosted by Professor Iti Chai uh, from Thailand, who is our uh, Bantane uh, Fujita uh, 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 Health University uh, alumni on uh, neurosurgery and uh, uh, sorry on on SNS endovascular neurosurgery and intervention neuroradiology neuroradiology a uh, web seminar which will be held on the third of February Saturday. Uh, starting from 1 p.m. Japan time up to about 4.30 p.m. Uh, with a theme of a useful practice for the current trends of endovascular uh, neurosurgery. We have about 10 uh, renowned uh, endovascular uh, surgeons. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are named, you have to see, uh, can be seen in the screen. And they will talk on various uh, techniques uh, which apply uh, worldwide and some complication which uh, uh, can be derived from uh, this procedure. And I uh, hope can, can uh, you all of you can join this seminar. I will send uh, official uh, information email with the brochure uh, shortly uh, to all our uh, uh, invited uh, participants. Or you may take a photo of the code uh, shown in this screen. Yeah, this is the last page, already, Professor. So this is the program starting from one pm. Uh, did you see? I'm going to the last screen. The uh, program. No, Lee, we can't see. Uh, hello. We cannot see. Uh, hello. Oh, only to the first speaker. The screen is not moving, Liu. Internet program. I think Liu got disconnected, it seems. Okay. 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 So, thank you so much. So, everyone, uh, today we had a very good, very high quality uh, lectures from three speakers. So, so uh, maybe uh, for each, so we need more uh, listen <laughs> the uh, lecture and lessons. I'm, I'm sorry. But, yeah. Ah, please, can, please continue. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I will send the email shortly to all of you. So I'm sorry for the for the technical. Okay. Yeah. So sorry, Raja. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, I think uh, we learned a lot from them. I think, and also we had a very nice discussion. And Daniel, thank you very much for joining today. So uh, I think, uh, uh, Raku, you learned a lot today, Raku. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Like, okay. So, like we said, say, thank you. Sachi, you, you have some question? No, oh, no, it was a wonderful webinar today. I really enjoyed <laughs> all the three speakers were excellent. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. So, thanks. So, ben. thank you. Yeah. So, on behalf of the uh, Educational Committee of the ACNS, and uh, we thank you for uh, joining us uh, to, tonight. And, uh, and, uh, and I would say that to, to today is a very uh, interesting and interesting days uh, with uh, interesting lectures and and it has uh, so many uh, meaningful topics uh, to all of us. And uh, I hope that uh, you will join us in our next meeting. And uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. So uh, see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.